Welcome to Tag Talk, your source for opinions and discussion on the Nerf hobby and community. I'm Jangler, and with me here today is Walcom S7. How you doing, Walcom? Doing pretty good, buddy. How about you? I am ecstatic that we are finally getting to do this. It has been years since we started talking about this. <laughs> oh my god! It's been a long time. I think I think you were asking to do this before you did the tag back episode where I, I was drunk and laying on the couch. I think you're right. So yeah, it's been a while, but we're, we're here. A long time. We got this going. <laughs> I'm glad. So since this is a new series, let's talk about how this format's going to work. This is a pretty relaxed kind of casual discussion format where uh, we have a topic. I know the topic. You know the topic because you can see the topic up here, but Walcom doesn't know the topic. So we're going to get... Good. Exactly. We're going to get a very fresh, very real perspective and insight from his initial thoughts on the topic. And uh, we'll go from there. I'll maybe play some devil's advocate here and there to kind of get some more thoughts and insight. But the idea is just a kind of casual, fun conversation. So with that said, uh, let's get into the first topic. Let's try not to disagree too much and kill each other, because that would be terrible. Yeah, I mean, if we go that far, that may be a little problematic. <laughs> so we'll, 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 we'll not go that intense, hopefully. <laughs> but all right. All right. Lay Today, it on me. Our first topic is, is Nerf getting too expensive? And this is a kind of broad topic, but there's a few ways we can go at it. And that is in the sense of the Hasbro Nerf branded toys. Are they getting too expensive? Is the hobby getting too expensive for newcomers or even general hobbyists as we have usually been a lower cost hobby? So there's a few ways to go at it. And I thought it would be an interesting place to start. Where do you exactly want to, do you want to lead this off or do you want my I, opinion? I right want your that? opinions on this. I want you to give your thoughts. So I can hit this at a couple of different angles. When it comes from Nerf as just the brand, are Nerf blasters becoming too expensive? There's obviously two sides to this, right? You got the Nerf stuff, then you got the Nerf stuff. Right. And the best part about that is regular Nerf is trash. <laughs> It is a dumpster fire right now. I am sorry. But We're hopping like, right I, into it. I am almost not excited for anything. Like people were excited for the Percy's and stuff like that. But when I see things like that, I'm like, I, I have a Prophet's era. I have a Prometheus. I have a Nemesis. Percy's, it's really cool. I want one. Do I own one? No, because it's $100. I'm going to wait until it's 40 bucks on Amazon during a clearance. That's exactly my... Weeks. My thought on the, the Nerf branded stuff is I, I, the Percy's is the first Nerf branded blaster I have wanted in a long time. But when I saw that hundred dollar price tag, I was, I, I, I don't need it. I don't, I don't need it. I can spend a hundred bucks on a hobby grade blaster and have something more personalized. And you the know. best example that I can think of right now of Nerf just not understanding things is I saw a boxed package of 60 rounds, 60 rival rounds. And you're like, wow, that's a new skew. I've never seen 60 rival rounds before. They wanted $13.88 at Walmart. So I'm assuming that's a $15 MSRP. That would be, that, that's likely what the case would be. So let's see, $15 for 60 rounds. If you broke that down, I'm trying to think of how many cents per round that is. I'll save you some trouble. You can get like the tactical strike rounds or the oh, X shot rounds. You can get yeah. like almost double that for the same price. Those and are honestly, always going to be good. cheaper. Always going to yeah. be cheaper. Uh, and then you've, of course, you know, got the proton rounds from out of darts and all. You've got plenty of options for them, though. A lot of people do really like to stick with the Hasbro branded rival rounds because they do seem to have a good consistency to them compared to other offerings. But guilty. I'm, I have a ton of them. I love them. And that's just the, the case. This is one of those few occasions, I think, where Hasbro actually kind of has something that's like, hey, the other brands aren't quite as good as this. Many other cases, we can't really say that, but kudos <laughs> Hasbro for having one thing that you're doing really, really well in terms of quality, and that's, that's rounds that people aren't buying. Speaking of other round, or other, speaking of <laughs> other brands, that's the other half of the solution, I would say, is that while Busby may have sort of they just slinked out of favor just a little bit these last couple of years with whatever has been going on with them. Zuru and especially Dart Zone, whether it's, you know, Target's Dart Zone or Primetime Toys under the Adventure Force line and whatnot, Absolutely. have been killing it. Yeah. They put out consistently 
interesting blasters at really, really good price points. That price point thing is huge, and Hasbro's response to it has not been the greatest in my mind. Their whole kind of skeletonized low-end blasters that don't do anywhere near as much in terms of fun factor or interesting engaging mechanics that some of the other brands are doing at those price points just it's almost mind-boggling and the the falling back on the number one blaster company branding that they're going with now is um it's concerning i think is honestly the way i would put it it's concerning for the health of the brand because to me that screams that they're kind of scrambling and, and and trying to reassert their dominance through marketing rather than through actual products, which maybe this is a wrong take here, but I, I mean, that's just kind of my perspective from someone who, granted, I haven't been as involved in the last year or so, so maybe this isn't as, you know, finger on the pulse as a year ago, but uh, it just kind of, it feels that way right now, I guess. Have you ever read the box of the darts, the ultra darts? Have you ever read the box no, package them? I have not, not the blaster, right? the box. I have not, and now I'm afraid to that you've mentioned it. I swear to Krom, on the box, it says flies up to 120 feet. Obviously, there's an asterisk there. But on the box, for the darts, it says they fly up to 120 feet. I mean, I, I'm sure if we put like them through a three-stage flywheel setup, we it could doesn't matter. probably do it. There's no blaster there. <laughs> that's They're true. trying to advertise that's true. their darts as being good because they fly up to that 120 they will. feet. That's, that's a... like saying, oh, all elite darts have 100-foot ranges. Here's the Maverick. That's a really good point. That's a really good way to put it. I, I was looking at it in terms of what would we need to do to get them to go that far as opposed to why are they being advertised as the performance variable when they are not? Well, Your that's not. That's actually not fair. The, the darts will obviously play a role in that performance, but they are not the thing propelling themselves. Exactly. They, they are Your not a self-contained unit. You. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So we were first topic. We've already gotten derailed from the 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 kind no, of no, main. We're attacking this kind, one step yeah, at a time. A little, yeah. So we're going deeper in than I'd initially anticipated, but I, I'm into it. I dig it. Uh, so the next part of your question was: Is it getting too expensive for newcomers to get into the hobby? Yes. And I would honestly say I don't think we've ever been in a better position for newcomers to get into the hobby. Okay, that is definitely a more interesting reply than I necessarily anticipated, which makes me happy here. And I think I know why, but I do want to hear your thoughts before I kind of put things in your mind. There's a couple of different reasons for that that I would say. One of them is that there are so many good, easy-to-mod blasters out now than there was eight years ago when I kind of jumped into things. It's way easier to go to like Walmart and then stop by Ace and then come home and build something that hits 150 FPS. That's I true. couldn't really do that before unless I was using an air blaster. Like the Rival Knockout, that is one of the things where it's like out of the box, that's a pretty okay blaster, but it's a little finicky and annoying. You spend maybe $12 in materials, more if you don't have the tool ups, obviously, but 12 bucks you can get that thing hitting 150 160 i've seen people with 180 yeah. 190 fps claims on them. those are truly impressive and uh, i remember i was kind of on the fence i'm like oh they're cool maybe 10 bucks i'll grab one and then seeing your video and others videos on them was like i should probably get one of these blasters it kind of feels like uh the newer generation of uh say the um night finder uh yeah. you know maybe maybe not as much potential but near that much it seems like from what people are getting just i mean it's been like what a month and people are already uh making these things monstrosities that are ten dollars plus minimal yeah. cost so think about the reflex six or the destroyer from walmart the zuru you know six yeah. shot revolver that thing with like a simple spring upgrade that's it would hit 130 fps and it's a revolver you can get multiple shots off of it it's the best world of both a night finder and then like a maverick or a strong arm put together right so yeah there that's a really good point that there are kind of more options for entry-level stuff now 
as opposed to in the past we had like the night finder as i mentioned and granted yes there were other platforms and other things people were doing and homemade was more kind of the focus back then but having kind of a myriad of different shells and blasters that you can work with does seem like a very inviting landscape for people to get into and not just feel like they're doing the same thing that everyone else is necessarily oh. and there's another part of that too because Think about five years ago, right? Picture yourself as Jangular five years ago in the Nerf community. How were flywheelers? We were um, in an interesting space. We'll put it that way. Uh, you had to actually, spend a lot of money just to get I like 130 where, FPS out of where a strife. Is it? Right there. The the Fabu strike on the wall is, you know, <laughs> Walcom's reacting. He can't actually see what I'm pointing at. But the point is that still has the same stuff inside of it that it did five years ago, which is a stock flywheel cage, stock wheels, and uh, stock everything else aside from the Rhino motors that were put in it to over or to, to just get some more performance out of it. We didn't have aftermarket wheels. We didn't have... Uh, aftermarket cages. We didn't have a whole lot of different options. So, yes. And how much did those Rhino motors cost you? Wow, what did Rhino motors cost back then? They were, they I weren't think, much. about four dollars. It was yeah. I, mean, I was going to say around five or so bucks, if I remember correctly. So yeah. it wasn't a ton. And um, you get like what, a hundred FPS out of a Rhino Strife? Basic everything. Oh, more than that. One hundred twenty to one hundred thirty. Yeah. Whoa! See, uh, that's that's news to me because I don't I was, think any of mine have ever hit that. Before. I was keep this in mind. I was running a strife, the the like V1 Fabu strife with uh, stock wheels, stock cage, just Rhino motors, and I was getting about 120s on them. And I was using that up until about two or three years ago. And this was all while we were testing our competitive King of the Hill format and everything. So like. It sufficed. It held up with stuff as, you know, newer tech was emerging. So I think the kind of point I'm rambling towards is that uh, it's easy to look at the landscape of things and see all the expensive, expensive kind of high tier builds and everything that you can throw into a build and be like, this is really pricey. This is a lot of money. I have to throw hundreds of dollars at something to have it be amazing. But Maybe you don't. But that leads me directly into the third part of your entire scheme here. Oh, good. Has it become too expensive as a hobby? And that is like a double-edged sword there because I would actually say yes. And the sole reason for that is five years ago when we had those Rhino motors and we were starting to get 130, 150 FPS out of strikes, we were just doing good. Right. Everything was perfect. Then we started getting Caliburns, and then, oh no, flywheelers couldn't hit as hard as Caliburns, and what started to happen? Brushless. And now, if you go to a war that has, say, a 200 FPS cap, and you want a 200 FPS flywheeler, oh man, it is so much money to get up to that point, even if you can get lucky with, like, a daybreak wheels and a cage and high crush with Krakens and stuff like that, you're still throwing money at full auto kits most of the time or 3D printed blasters with really good triggers as opposed to a Strife, FDL 3s, all that stuff. Caliburns aren't exactly inexpensive, you know, 120 bucks for a kit or more if you want a pre-assembled one. And yeah, it does, as we chase that stronger dragon, you can no longer get like a, a war-worthy, I would say an NIC level blaster just going to ace with like a retaliator or something and putting something together. You can get good performance out of it, mind you, but to hit that like 200 FPS dragon to tag that thing, it is so much more money than it used to be because it just keeps going higher and higher. The threshold goes more and more and people want to get somewhat near that threshold or you're just being outperformed. At least that's the logic. I would still argue that somebody like you with a 130 FPS drive could probably wreck me with a 200 FPS FDL three. <laughs> that all depends on the situation, the scenario, but I, the, the context or the, the idea behind your statement, I agree. The player does matter just as much or more than the blaster in most cases. So you will be able to go to a game and if you play well and play smart and all that, you can make yourself valuable and useful to your team and just to anyone around. Besides, you're, just there, you're there to have fun. Let's be real. But uh, that actually, you're, you're, you're kind of, 
statement there about not being able to go to the hardware store and, and just put something together that will be at that highest kind of cap. I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of want to throw out a challenge now to anybody Ooh. watching. What can you build from the hardware store? What is your best from say taking a trip to Ace or Home Depot or something? I'm curious for like that super affordable budget, but still want to go homemade. How affordable can you make it and get something at a high end of performance? So I you gotta wanna... put like 17 asterisks next yeah. to that. <laughs> you've got like a CNC machine, or you've got like you know, well, that's, with like that's a, fair. a drill press and a scroll, a scroll saw, and they're absolute geniuses like Captain Slug and whatnot. They are, you know, they can hammer out these amazing blasters out of PVC and cutting Delrin cutting boards right. and Home Depot springs. You know what I mean? But so, yeah. I know for a long time, I couldn't build a snap bow. I didn't have a drill press. I didn't have anything to really do that. And I didn't even have like the saw to do it. And those are expensive tools. I don't so, expect people to have that kind of stuff at home. Yeah, so without the use of say expensive or more relatively expensive tools like table saws and, and drill presses and stuff like that, what can you make? We'll put it that way. Well, that, we'll, seen, that'll be. I've seen this blaster. I swear if, <laughs> and somebody's gonna blow us away in the comments immediately. I'm looking swear, forward to it. Might it. Have, it might've been Captain Slug. Somebody Probably. did a challenge for like the easiest homemade. And I think there was like a 200 FPS, like pump snap bow i wouldn't that be surprised was like a drill I, i'm definitely i'll look forward to it hopefully somebody will be like you're idiots in the comments and just drop a bomb on us and, and it'll be fantastic no I'll, the real challenge is going to the dollar store and building oh God. the best possible blaster that, that well that's that's a hard mode challenge i'm <laughs> <laughs> but uh, back on the topic of kind of the growing expense in our hobby it's something that I think is a shifting kind of mindset. Uh, we started as a very homegrown, homemade kind of hobby where low cost was kind of the norm for most things. And now we're growing into a more, I hesitate to use this word because I don't think it's the right word, but it's for the sake of uh, time right now, we'll say legitimate hobby. Um, meaning we have businesses around it, we have third party industries around it, and there's a lot more options. So with that, and with that kind of creativity and ingenuity, uh, in that design area comes cost for kind of low uh, minimum order kind of thresholds for specialty parts and things like that, small batch type stuff. Uh, so we see more and more expense go at it, but I think the important thing is for, for us to put things in perspective that just because those exist don't necessarily mean they are a necessity for you. Yes, you can buy an FTL3. Yes, I love my FTL3 and it's my go-to competitive blaster. Mine too. But uh, teammates of mine run dual fishes and they absolutely tear things up with them. And those are four flywheels or four flywheel motors, four flywheels, and a cage inside a, a swordfish shell. So that's not nearly as much in terms of cost. So you can still get there. It's just a matter of what you really want out of the hobby. So I think that's kind of where I end up on this. It all comes down to perspective and what you are focusing on. Which is why I still... A lot of times when I'm doing a build, like the latest thing I've been working on, that double liberator shotgun... There's no 3D print in that. There's no any, I just built it with putty and hardware store tools and bolted things together and made a blaster. And that's the part of the hobby that I enjoy, that I like the most. And it's not very expensive. It takes a lot of work, a lot of time and a lot of effort, but it doesn't cost as much as say 3D printing out an entire kit or worse yet, 3D printing out an entire new blaster and then putting that together and then putting in all the aftermarket parts and stuff into it and winding up with a $300 blaster. Which is super cool and fun. It's just a different yeah. aspect. Like that's yeah. that's the really the best part is there's so many different avenues available that whatever you want, like the method you're talking about, that's like Mr. Nathan approved right there. And then you've got like the more engineering side of things with all of the, you know, product design kind of stuff and like everywhere in between those two ends, we've got a lot going on and I love that. But with that said, I think this is a good place to ask all of you what are your thoughts on this topic? This is a discussion and it's not just between the two of us, it's involving all of you. So let us know if you think we're idiots, if you think we're onto something, if there's something we didn't hit. But please 
Let us know your thoughts down below. This is something we're hoping to do with regularity. I have, I think I, I ended Walcom. <laughs> because the obvious answer is yes, Walcom's an idiot. So I'm just expecting oh, you can't, that one. You can't just put it on you. Now. It's on both of us. It's on both of us if that's the case. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Take care, everyone.